next item on the agenda, fear and pollution, the formerly the word never spoke in the fear and pollution, uh, presented by Council Vice Mayor and Board of Directors, Dave Rubin. Thank you. Thank you, Sid. I'm not a microphone guy. Hopefully, can you hear this? Or hello, hello. Maybe I will have to hold it up to my face. I just don't want anybody to see my hand shaking. Um, yeah, what a hum humbling and uh, honorable privilege to be standing in front of uh, this room. Um, it's uh, it's um, a miracle that I'm actually here today. So um, I want to thank everybody for uh, for being a part of this important day and. Um, um, you know, making this thing work. It's magic, it really is, you know. Um, I joined the Peel Regional Police in uh, August 27, 1984. August 26, 1984, um, Dwayne Pukula became the first Peel police officer to be murdered in the line of duty. So um, my third day on the police department was um, uh, doing a traffic point for a police funeral and it was, uh, it was uh, an experience. That year, um, I think in about an eight month period, there were mm -hmm. Uh, seven police officers murdered in the line of duty in Ontario. It was the year of the killing, and and that left a real um, a real strong impression on me. And you know, um, knowing that a police officer was murdered in our police service uh, with a knife attack, and uh, and uh, seeing other officers fall, you know, in the line of duty, uh, you know, it had an effect in the in the sense that it it brought me to a place that. Um, you know, that I was very familiar with from, from a very young age, from being a young boy, and, and that was fear. Um, and I joined the police department at a time when, when um, y you kind of had to, uh, well, and I don't think it's much different today, but you had to have that real big bravado, you know, balls the size of, of church bells, and, and um, everything was a test. Um, you know, I, my f my my first week on the road, I was uh, I was on uh, a night shift, and it was my third shift, and um, I, I faced uh, a, a very serious edged weapon attack, and and could have lost my life at that time. And 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 you know, I'd been through my recruit training, and been through police college, and I'd been through all this. Um, you know, I was in a group with like four four hundred and fifty men at the Ontario Police <laughs> College, and they were all type triple A personalities, and you know, who was bigger and stronger and faster. And, and then I felt, I felt like about this big again. And I was crippled with fear that night. And, um, you know, I went back to the police station and, and uh, during the debrief, I was, I was uh, you know, belittled by some, uh, some uh, senior officers in, in the uh, detective's office and in how I almost lost my life. And it, and it wasn't anything that was supportive. It was like, this better never happen because I won't show up at your funeral because you fucked up. You made a mistake. You're a loser. And, and you know, from that moment on, I vowed my third day on the job alone. This is never going to happen again. I, I will not allow this to happen to me. And, uh, you know, I, I set out uh, for the next 25 years to prove that um, I was the best cop on the street. I was a street monster. And I spent 19 years in plain clothes and in special services and working undercover and, and um, I had a lot of success in my career. Um, I was very fortunate in, in all the lateral movements and, and working in the, uh, the areas that I did. Um, just given the nature of some of the work that I did, I was, I was uh, probably involved in at least a dozen undocumented and unreported uh, um, knife and gun incidents during my undercover work and and that was just the nature of the work it's just stuff that happened that just we didn't we just didn't report it just went it just went and you know that's the kind of stuff that kept getting buried and pushed down you know uh, i spoke earlier about the uh, the fear that i was so familiar with i'm i'm uh i'm a survivor of childhood uh abuse physical and sexual and and uh so that fear, you know, from that very, very little little boy was was sitting right inside of my gut, and and every time I faced something on the job, every time I saw that, you know, that that hanger, the first dead baby, the first bad car accident, the carnage, the first rape, the first homicide, and and all that fear just came flooding back into me, and and it was it was something that I had no control over, but I had to stuff it down. So I started to drink pretty heavily, and uh, you know, drinking became my my coping mechanism. Um, in the early 90s, uh, I, I lost a, a good friend 
uh, and a former colleague who, who was shot in the head with his own gun and and that had an uh, an incredible an incredibly negative um, effect on me and in that it's it sent me into a, a, a real spiral of depression and so in the early 90s I you know I visited my doctor and and uh, um, I was prescribed medications at that time and and then in the early 90s I also went on to work in in the drug unit and worked in intelligence and and one of our speakers here today uh, Chief Dan Parkinson from Cornwall was a, a colleague at that time in SEAL as well and he headed up the intelligence uh, unit and and you know I have the utmost respect for this man but I would walk into the building and I remember you know saying good morning sir and 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 just being full of fear and my stomach was just like a knot and and but you know you're in that you're in that role you're playing that game I had this cape on the big Scott cape you know with the S and I was going to save the world um, so this went on this went on for years and years and uh, you know I, I don't want to stand up here and tell all kinds of stories and and uh, um, Sid spoke earlier about war porn this isn't about war porn I could I could tell like like anybody in this room a hundred a hundred stories and um, it's not about that it's just about my emotions and my feelings and what I felt as a result of those things and how I reacted to it and I buried this shit I buried it deep and it started to affect me physically it affected me emotionally it affected my home life um, you know I, I was challenged I was very challenged I, I've uh, I was I was in and out of relationships. I had dysfunctional relationships. I couldn't hold a um, um, a marriage together, and and um, and things started to crumble. Um, in the late '90s, I I was uh, finishing up working um, in the drug unit, and um, I had uh, suffered an exposure, uh, a chemical exposure, doing a lab, and uh, and and I and I was injured. In, in the sense that uh, I burned my lungs and my esophagus, but you know, when I brought it to the attention of my supervisors, they they basically said, you know, you don't like it, get out of the unit. There's a hundred guys that are just dying to be a drug cop in this department, and so that was the kind of stuff that we faced. Eh? And I thought, Jesus, even my physical health, like, never mind. Imagine, like, I told them that I have something that's really I'm concerned about, and and I can't even imagine if I was going to say to them that I'm struggling emotionally, I'm feeling depressed, that I'm s I'm suffering from night terrors, that. I wake up sweating and screaming and I've knocked over my lamp and I've smashed my glass off the night table and that I, I wake up and I have I go from from passed out cold to 200 miles an hour and I don't have feelings and I don't have emotion and I don't have any sadness or joy or happiness there's nothing there I'm void of all of that and all I have is anger and rage and fury and that's what I'm carrying in my gut I, I couldn't even imagine trying to trying to articulate that and and, and say Oh, and by the way, I want to move on to homicide next. <laughs> that wasn't going to happen, right? So we buried the shit. We just buried it, and we lived with it. I did. And um, you can still hear me in the back? Now you can. You missed a really great speech. <laughs> I'm lost in my head. I'm a let, me, let me try again. My name is Gary Ruby. I work for the field. <laughs> My name is Gary Ruby. Anyway, I, um, in the late 90s, I, I decided that, um, you know what, I think it's time for a career change. And, and uh, I, I moved from the drug unit to the fraud bureau thinking that, you know, leaving, leaving a place that, uh, that was, was um, uh, you know, so intense um, would, would change my emotional makeup and, and probably help uh, uh, with what I was going through. And, and it didn't, you know. Drug unit, fraud bureau, same pile of shit, different corner. That's that's all that was, and and so I, I engaged in um, um, entertaining a, a, a career change, and in um, it took about a year, a year and a half, putting a business plan together, and and um, uh, <coughs> through an interview process, and um, e eventually I was accepted as a trainee agent for State Farm Insurance. So I left the Peel Police on. Um, uh, September 3rd, 2001, and I joined uh, State Farm Insurance. And on September 11th, we had the uh, terrorist attacks in New York City. And you know, I, I've spoken with Dan about this too. Like one of the s single most catastrophic events uh, since the Second World War, and it's the, the effect that it had on me was, what am I doing knocking on doors? I'm not an insurance salesman. I don't like <coughs> knock on doors. I kick them in. So I, I put my Scott cape back on, and I went running back to the police department and. Um, 
you know, a short time later, our, our department uh, decided that they were going to start a, um, um, an ICE unit, which was Internet Child Exploitation. I, I had a lot of undercover experience up to that point, so um, I was asked to head up the uh, online luring section, which I did. Um, I, I can tell you, you know, I, I've had seven friends, seven friends and colleagues suicide. I've had two gentlemen that I knew murdered in the line of duty, and they were friends, and, um, you know, my own trauma and experience. But what I witnessed in, in, uh, in working child pornography was so sick and so twisted, it, it pushed me completely over the edge. Um, so all that shit that I'd been building up, all the booze that I'd been pouring in to try to make it stop, to make the noise stop in my head, none of it worked anymore. I was in a situation that uh, I was going to explode, and, um, and that happened. Uh, in 2008, I had a, um, uh, a colleague who, who had been a friend for 25 years and, and uh, had been fighting a two-and-a-half-year battle with cancer. He passed away, and a month later, a lady that I was uh, in a relationship with um, was diagnosed and died very quickly of cancer. Um, I was on the police association at the time, on the union, and when I left the union, um, just to kind of get my world together, uh, the gentleman that replaced me, who, who was a friend and a colleague, ended up suiciding, shot himself in the head. Um, by this time, I, I joined uh, a 12-step recovery program, and, and I was working with a gentleman um, in that recovery program, and uh, in the fall of that year, he decided that he wanted to commit a murder-suicide. He would take my life and then end his own life, and when I told him he was crazy and threw him out of my house, he suicided. So I had four deaths, um, you know, very quickly in a short period of time, and, and it was just, it was more than I could take, and uh, I had what I thought was uh, a nervous breakdown in December of, of 2008. 